Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show <coughs> excuse me, live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing um, today and it will be available in our show archives for you to watch later at your convenience and i'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of those recordings both our live show and our recordings are free and open to for anyone to watch so please do share with your friends family neighbors colleagues uh, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on encompass live um, here at the Nebraska Library Commission, we are the state agency for libraries. So we provide um, resources and services and training and grants to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live uh, for all types of libraries, public, academic, K-12, um, corrections, museums, archives, um, anything and everything. Really, our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries, uh, something cool that libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing. Um, we have um, presentations that are done by Nebraska Library Commission staff um, about resources and programs and services we offer through the commission. Um, but, and, but we also sometimes bring on guest speakers to talk about cool things they're doing in their library or um, just sharing what they're doing. And today um, it's kind of a mixture, mostly our guests, but eh. I'll be chiming in as appropriate. Um, today we are talking about Nebraska public library laws. Um, as it says here, chapter 51 and beyond. Uh, and Scott Childers, who is the executive director of our Southeast Library System is with us this morning. Good morning, Scott. Good morning. And um, he is, I would, I would say, one of our experts on this topic, um, does a lot of research and, and, and helping libraries with it. All of our system directors are resources for that. We have four regional library system directors in the state. Um, the Scott has seemed to have taken the lead on a lot of it. Um, I also help libraries and uh, with giving advice um, and my interpretations of uh, how the laws are and, and what they're all about. Um, but I know, I think, Scott, you've spoken about this at other meetings before too, correct? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I, I will again too. You know, I mean, this is something that we're, we're constantly kind of reminding folks it exists so yeah <laughs> that's one of the the one major issues here uh so i think we'll get started here i'm gonna um turn off my camera but then go on to our first most important page so i'll just hand over to you uh scott to take it away um and i will uh chime in as i said as as i feel the need and if anyone does have any questions comments um Anything you're confused about with the laws, uh, definitely type into that question section of your GoToWebinar interface. I have this open here, so I'm keeping an eye on that as well. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I apologize for the technical issues. Of course, you know, it was working fine previously, and then today it just not working right. But of most course. importantly, <laughs> um, so I do, do not have access to the chat or anything. So please do put stuff in there, and then Krista will. Krista, will pop in and ask your questions for you. So yes. most importantly here, the disclaimer. Uh, the presenters, Chris and I, are not acting as any attendees legal counsel and the information presented should not be construed as actual legal advice or the promise of such. The goal, the goal of the presentation is to make you aware that such things exist. If you are in a situation where you need legal advice, please contact a legal professional. Also, I know that sometimes we get people from outside of the state attending these or might watch the recording. The laws that we are talking about are Nebraska state specific. So your laws may and most likely will be different, especially around the areas of library governance. There are many models across the nation. We are focusing on the Nebraska ones only today. Right. So. Um, and here at the Library Commission and through the systems, we, um, we are available to help libraries interpret these statutes and give advice and suggestions um, and our opinion on them, but definitely uh, if you, we are not attorneys and 
uh, do not have that you cannot give out actual legal advice. Um, <clears throat> you'd need to contact someone else for that. But we're here to help <clears throat> get started, I would think. Yeah, yeah definitely. And, and Chris and I have both talked with city attorneys too. So it, it's not yeah. like we're unfamiliar with that. So yes, we do. We do <laughs> consult with other attorneys with um, sometimes the League of Nebraska Municipalities is very helpful in these kind yes. of situations. Um, so yeah, we have, you know, we're not just making this up off the top of our heads. <laughs> right. So let's go ahead and move on. Okay. So uh, we're going to touch on some things that are pretty much universal for libraries. And then near the end, we'll actually get to the chapter 51 um, and, and some more of the governance things. But we're going to start out with some of these library related issues. First one we want to talk about um, Nebraska Revised Statute 84-712.05. That number is there so that way you can see the full text. You can look it up and we'll have a link to that at the very end. Um, so that way you can confirm that these are actual state statutes. It's not, you know, us pulling stuff out of the hat. I will admit we have had to cut down some and leave some context out for clarity for today. That's why we're putting the full uh, reference there. Um, let's talk about library records. The following records, unless publicly disclosed in an open court, open administrative proceeding, or open meeting, or disclosed by a public entity pursuant to its duties, may be withheld from the public by the lawful custodian of records. So what we're talking about here is library records, and that's that bottom part here. Records are portions of records kept by a publicly funded library, which when examined with or without other records reveal the identity of any library patron using libraries, materials, or services, which means the usage of your library, the materials and everything within is a confidential record per state law. And you as librarian can decide to keep those private um, unless there's like a, an actual legal warrant or search request, right? So someone coming in and asking what their neighbor is reading, you have full authority under state law to not answer that question. So that's something to keep in mind is like some people think, well, it's just kind of librarianship in general. It's like, no, we actually have a state law that says that the librarian can keep those records private, confidential, so. Mm -hmm. And I know this is uh, something that in some, we have had the, <clears throat> we've heard people have said in some smaller towns that, oh, they just, we just give this out and someone asks, you know, everyone knows what everyone's doing. That's not, you should not be doing that, no. Yeah. It is a legal issue that you do need to be aware of and do not share this information. Um, even if, you know, oh, well, we're friendly with the local police and they just wanted to know. They need to do it the right way too, in even the smallest towns. I think that's something good to bring up right here now that I just mentioned it. There are no town, no cities, villages, towns in Nebraska that are um, exempt from any of these laws. Mm -hmm. uh, the size of your town, there's no town that is too small to not have to follow the laws. That has been something that has been voiced to me and I've possibly to you, Scott, in the past. Oh, yes. Someone has said, someone either in the city administration or something has said, oh, well, we're too small to have to follow those rules that the commission wants us to follow. Number one, these are not commission, Nebraska Library Commission rules. These are Nebraska state laws. And no, there is no town that is too small to have to follow the Nebraska state laws. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It, it, I, I was in a meeting where a, a village board member said, well, we did ratify these. Doesn't matter. It's state law. They override your local ordinance. That's another thing yeah. too. Yes, yes. The your your community, your city, your village council does not have to ratify Nebraska state statutes. Yes. This Nebraska state legis legislature makes these the, laws. Um, the the people you voted for to go to the union camera did that process for you. So yeah. All right. So all right. So we um, do have a question about records since we're on this okay. um, slide here. We'll definitely. Yeah, definitely type in your questions as soon as you are um, thinking of them. 
Uh, someone wants to know what happens if a library receives a subpoena for records? Must okay. they comply? Yes, that would be one of those um, open court type of things. It's an actual legal document saying you have to provide this. Um, mm -hmm. So a subpoena, search warrant, but those are actual court documents. And so you must comply with those. Someone just walking in and saying, hey, we'd like to know this or that. You mm -hmm. can say, no, get a, get a search warrant and we'll, we'll do that or a subpoena and we'll provide that information. That is exactly um, what the police do have to do. They have to provide you with a subpoena or a search warrant or something to that. Yeah. Right, right. But yeah, it has to be an actual subpoena or search warrant or that type of court document issued by a judge. So. Yes. All right. All right. Um, so continuing on, this is a little bit further in that same statute, confidential library records. This one has popped up a little bit more often, so I wanted to bring it up. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but uh, library, archive, etc. Get donations from non-governmental agencies and preserved for reference research exhibition, right? Um, so the donor, seller, whatever, uh, can be kept confidential for a specified period of time. So if someone wants to donate their private collection to the library and they want to keep it anonymous, that is a right that they have enshrined in state law. This doesn't, it hasn't come up too often, but every so often, it, it rarely, I want to say rarely, something mm -hmm. pops up uh, if people want to know who gave a special collection to the library. Um, Normally, when a special collection is donated, they want the name out there because it's part of a memorial or something. Sure. This sure. is kind of rare. But I do want to mention that it is possible that donors uh, for materials and stuff to a library can be kept confidential for um, as part of the donor agreement. So. You want to make sure they, they actually, yeah, Dick, um, state that specifically in the agreement. This is what this is what this gift is for, this is where it should yes. go, yeah. this is for how long I want to be remain, and it could be for in perpetuity if they want, but um, it could be just for a certain amount of time, yeah. Get everything in writing. Yes, and keep the writing. <laughs> yes, save Alrighty. those documents. I have had that happen too. Oh, we received this gift and this or this amount of money and nobody can find the paperwork about what we're supposed to do with it or how we're supposed to use it. Oh, please, yeah. save everything. Yeah. Scan everything and save it to somewhere <laughs> on a hard drive, on a flash drive, something. Okay. All right. I think we're ready for the next slide. Okay. This is starting to pop up a lot more in just mm -hmm. library shipping in general. So I figured I'd bring it up today. We haven't talked about this often in the past, but there is um, something in state statute on the definition of obscenity. Um, again, chapter 28.807 has that. This is based off what they call the Miller test or the three prong test that's used federally. Ours is enshrined in here that this is what it means to be obscene. Um, and it's still kind of vague and it's still kind of per case, right? So obscene means that the average person would find the work uh, predominantly appeals to the purient, purient interest or shameful or morbid interest in nudity, sex or excretion. Um, it, whatever it is depicts it in a patently offensive way um, and the work or performance or material lacks serious literary artistic political or scientific value um, there's a key phrase in this that we have to keep in mind taken as a whole mm -hmm. right if there's an actual trial on obscenity like a material is actually going to trial for being obscene it is taken as a whole not random bits and pieces taken out of context. This is the legal definition as best we have it in the state. Granted, there's a lot of people who, who will find things offensive. That doesn't make it obscene. Mm -hmm. um, and these are distinctions that may start playing a part in your book challenge processes and whatnot. And to be honest, what people find offensive and obscene changes. I was in a library board meeting and the library board member wanted a particular book taken off the children's shelves because the title included the word 
fart. <laughs> that was their reason. The title had the word fart. This is a book for kids that's probably going to check out a lot because the, it talks about the human body. And that's how kids refer to that process. They don't use the term flatulence. Uh, so again, the, the material as a whole. Um, this, like I said, this comes from the federal precedent created by courts called the Miller test or three prong test. There might be something that changes that in the future, but currently this is what we have in state law for obscenity. This is the legal definition of it. Mm. Uh, people are throwing around the term just randomly. And a lot of the materials they talk about have not actually looked, been looked at under these type of things, the three prong. You may also want to adopt this type of language in your book feedback policy, mm. the book challenge yes. policy. So use the law. Um, yes. And note that this is an and it's a three prong. It's not an or. Exactly. It has to meet all three of these. Mm hmm. Okay. So. Um, OK, so let's unless there's questions, let's move on to the next part. OK, further on in that same chapter, chapter 28, defense against prosecution. Currently, it is state law that it people working in libraries have a defense against prosecution if something happens to be found in their collection that people think are, are obscene we currently have that state law some states don't have it some states mm. have changed theirs um currently this statute there have been some things introduced in the past two or three years um it really hasn't gotten much traction because there have been other issues that the legislature really wanted to look at. Um, I have a feeling this will be also introduced next year that, that will remove public libraries protection and could turn, uh, someone could be criminally charged for what is in their public library collection, depending on what changes actually happen, if any. So I want, wanted to bring this up. This is something that's currently being talked about by our legislators. Um, and so we have to be aware of what is in there now and what those changes could mean later on if things progress. So mm. for now, we are fine, but there are legislators that want to change it and take away the protection from librarians. And uh, also, depending on whose version you're reading, also, there's a bit in here about schools as well. And so there could be some things with that or universities are there. They're in part of the context I left out on this slide. Mm. Uh, but it would be good to kind of realize what we have now and what's being talked about. So keep an eye on uh, the le legislature. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, I think. OK, um, Open Meeting Act. I do want to mention it. It's a law that we we need to be aware of because most of our library boards fall under this. Um, there are a few that aren't legally established. They're, they're more of a nonprofit or just community folks running a, a, a reading room. Um, but most of us would fall under this. And we're going to do a whole hour on this on mm -hmm. July 19th. Yep. So please plan on joining us then or watching the video, there's a lot of nuance in that one. And I don't want to give it short shrift in, in this. We need to focus on other bills or other state statutes. Um, Which is why we pulled it out for our, its own, its own uh, show. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> it is one of those that's very important for libraries to know about and to follow. So we'll, we'll have answer questions about that on July 19th. Mm -hmm. or, and you or may, various uh, other meetings. <laughs> yeah. And it, oh, yeah. We do, this is a regular thing. Yeah. Um, and we did do a session on the Open Meetings Act last year, if anyone remembers, about mm -hmm. a year ago. Uh, but things do change um, based and because of um, bills that have been put through in the legislature. And so we do have some changes from last year's session, too. So another reason why we're doing um, a new one for the Open Meetings Act. So, yeah, sign up for that one if you haven't already. Um, July 19th, about a month from now. Okay. Then I'll go. Okay. So what's next? 
All right, so the, the meat of today, library board statutes, things to talk about specifically library governance. I do wanna mention a couple of things. Um, so it's big, there are like four types of tiers with, with this. We have the metropolitan class, which would only be Omaha. They have their own special section. It is basically, you know, it, it's a different focus because they are so large. Primary class, which is only Lincoln currently. And that, that one, um, it's like one of those two, it's just a paragraph that says the city can open the library and create regulations and stuff like that. So there's not a lot of meat for either of those because those cities are basically doing it on their own. So let's move on to the next one. Okay, cities of the first class. So this is uh, cities of 5,000 to 100,000 population. This isn't like a quality type of measurement. You know, some people say we have a first class city. No, it's strictly the tier name. Um, this is where <laughs> things get a little weird. <laughs> um, so I have pulled a couple of those things out of that state statute that uh, city of the first class may have um, library services without a, a governing library board. It's in there. And, and again, there's like the other two, there's not a lot of meat in the state statute on how to run the library if your first class city and the city council is is acting as the governing agency. This is almost it. Um, there's a little bit more. Um, now, that said, first class cities certainly could do a model based on chapter 51. That is actually recommended because there's a lot of more useful information on who, do, who does what. But over the years, um, I think when I started, we were a little bit over a quarter of first class cities had a purely advisory board. And now mm. we're over half. Mm. Um, Another thing that it again it's outside of this context, but you could have a hybrid model where the city's running all the personnel stuff and all of the policy is that power is given back to the library board. Right? So it doesn't have to be all or nothing. And I've seen a few that over the years they have given more power back to the library board because city council doesn't want to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. <On> the other <laughs> On the other hand, we've seen some cities pull all the power out of the library board because of some conflict between the librarian and the board. So we've seen it go both ways, um, but it's only first class. And mm -hmm. I know there have some, there have been some folks I've talked to, some cities where they want to do this, but they are sitting at 4,800. Mm -hmm. They don't have the power to do that. They nope. have to have a governing board. Right, they're not first class, so they can't pull it. So anything below a, that five thousand is a governing board by state statute. Yep. Yep. And and like Scott's mentioned, you'll notice this says um, the mayor and the city council and the city class may establish, and may mm -hmm. that is a key word as well. May means it's optional. Mm -hmm. So this does not mean cities of the first class have to do this. Go by you know, statute since 16 here, um, it's an option. So you, yeah. you you don't have to do this. You can go, like you said, to the chapter 51, where there is a lot more detail and and um, help for libraries and how they are supposed to be run and how their boards are supposed to be run. And so if yeah. your city either is trying to do th run things and don't know what they're doing, or like you like Scott mentioned, the ones that are just like, eh, there's so many things that libraries do that are different from other, other departments. We don't want to learn it. That's perfect. That's fine. That's why you've got chapter 51. And mm -hmm. you can use that as well. It's an option. You're not forced to have to do this. So um, it's yeah. good that you've got that you know, in your back pocket there as a... It's okay, don't worry, we got this, but you got to put it all in writing. Put it in your yes. board bylaws that says we, in, we are following this particular state statute to run our library and then here's how that all works. So put it in, in your board's um, official bylaws stating which, if you are a city of the first class, which way you're going, which uh, statute you're following. 
Yeah. And, and if you're doing a hybrid type thing. Right. Yeah. Whichever way you're doing. Put you those know. out like the city council shall be in charge of all personnel uh, and, and hours or whatever that mix is. And the library board shall have control over the collection development and you know whatever else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So. The things that probably city council members don't want to do, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I, I wish I could give more solid advice based on state statutes with first class cities, but there, I mean, there's not a lot in there right now. So that's kind of, I wish I could give you more. But if I'm going straight out of state statute, there's not much there that we can give. Yeah. That's why it's kind of a shorter thing. Um, and, and it really base it's based on where is that city council at this particular moment? What can the asks be? Um, so that it, it's going to be very specific. And that's that's another problem with giving a statewide talk about this particular part. Um, yeah. So, yeah. We have all righty levels, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so city says the second class and villages. This is basically anyone else in the state that's not Lincoln, Omaha, or the the first class cities. So yes, there are state statute for you. Um, like okay, Krista so mentioned, we <laughs> we have some small small people. It's like, well, it doesn't matter. That's for Lincoln and Omaha. No, they have their own. This is for you guys. Right. So there's so. Lincoln, there's Omaha, there's five, everyone else is 5,000 to 100,000. And then there's up to 4,999. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> and I think here, uh, this, I assume this is a typo here that I, I didn't look closely. This, this should be this, this, uh, the wording from the second. That, that is a copy and paste error. That is still yes. the text out of the first class. So let's skip this slide. We'll, we'll <laughs> fix this before we put the slides out to you all. Yep, that was a, a so cities, <laughs> second class villages. Now we're getting into that. So let's go ahead and move into the next slide. This is where the meat of it is. Fifth chapter 51 has more, most of the public library specific. Okay, so we'll start at the very first part, board creation and makeup. Granted, you're already, most of, I don't have a list of attendees that you're in front of me, but you're probably already created, right? But there is something in here that is a definition that'll be used later on, and that's basic services. Basic services shall include, but not be limited to, free loan of circulating print and non-print materials for local collection and general reference and information services. And there's, that's kind of the, the base of it. There's more later on in, in there that talks about a little bit more, but basic services, you give those to your tax base free. Right. And so you can't charge the people who live in your town for a library card. And yes, there was a village that was asking if they could do that. It's like, no, that goes against state statute. Mm -hmm. If you're a library, you have to give to your, your, usually it's town. There are some township libraries and some county based ones. And so you follow who is the primary funder right. as far as who gets the free services. So forgive me if I if I've forgotten to mention that in the earlier today, but if your county is your primary funder, then everyone in the county gets these free services. Same with township or city or village. So okay. So and that's the key. This is whoever pays the taxes that help fund your library. You are this allowed to have a um non-resident card and charge for that. Yep. That is where it's not your tax base, and that's where it's okay. Um, so I've, I've had people ask about that too, because we do reference this um, in our accreditation standards for public libraries, that we basically just copy the same wording from the law saying you have to provide these particular services for free. And um, I think on there, we do clarify about being to your legal service area or, or whatever the wording is we use. But um, but yes, if the, if you do a non-resident cards and you charge for that, for them to use anything, then yes, that's okay because they're not your residents. That's the difference. Yep. Okay. Go on, there we go. All right, so board creation and makeup. This is a, a, a lot larger section, but I would just wanted to, to point out uh, the library board shall have at least five members and 
I, I use the term five slots because we know people move in, people move out. Some people are have to drop out of a board because of mm -hmm. health or, or whatever. But you have to have at least five slots. And if you have a open, you're actively working towards filling those five. You mm -hmm. could have a 21 person library board if you really wanted to. <laughs> um, Please don't. I, I can imagine scheduling that would be horrible. <laughs> so five is a good number. The mayor and any member of the city council or village board shall, shall not be a member of the library board. They could certainly attend meetings, but they are not a voting member of the board. Um, and here's the thing, uh, as far as your term limits, if you have any, the term length, all of that is decided locally. There is not a state statute that says you have to have X number of terms or you have to term limit out the library board or, or any of that. That is local. Depending on the makeup of your town, you may really want to have long term uh, library me board members. Mm -hmm. it, or it might be something where you want quick turnaround because you need different ideas at different points. Um, so that is the question I've got. It's like, what does the state say? And the state says, let the cities decide on, on that particular yep. matter. So. This is one good thing I think about our Nebraska statutes is they do understand each community is going to be different and mm -hmm. is going to have the ability to handle this differently. If you're a very small community and you don't have a lot of people, you know, running for board or wanting to be on the board, you might want them to be uh, the ones who are willing to do it to be there longer. <laughs> Yeah. Because it's harder to find members. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Um, and uh, something else, too, about this to highlight is that the city council or village board is the one who determines how it is, how the board is created, um, and whether it's an election or appointed. Um, mm -hmm. the, the, the library board themselves don't do that. I guess, yeah, because <laughs> this is coming from the state statutes that say, how do you create a public library in the first place? Like if you want one brand new, you've never had one. Well, the city council has a resolution, says you're going to have one. And then the city council says, and we're going to have a board of five members and we're going to, we all will appoint them every five years or whatever. Um, so that's something also to be aware. I've had that question as well. So who's in mm -hmm. charge of deciding who's on the library board? Well, yeah. you have what should have, it's, at some point when your library was first created, the city or village board would have had to decide, are we appointing or are we electing? And that should be in writing somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Find it. And I don't think there's any library of this, uh, in this size, that has an election for library board. I don't think I've ever heard of it. No, it's an option, but I don't think anyone is doing yeah. it now. Yeah. And, and the actual That's process of, of how you get people to that city council level for approval that's your local procedure. I mean, there's some mayors who will go to the library and say, okay, library board time, who's coming, who, who, you have suggestions for me to approach? And then there's other cities where the librarian, uh, and current library board are just kind of left out and it's the city who decides who they're appointing. Um, that is local. Um, but again, it, it's, what works best for that community as far as getting to that point where you actually have people to put that rubber stamp on and say, you're now the library board member. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. And I, you know, there are certain things and we're going to get more into what things the library board is responsible for and which ones the city. Mm -hmm. and the city. I always try and to, I, I, I tell libraries, it, the, the best situation is if you work well and congeal you, con, con, you know, well with your city council. Don't work against them. And from their side, too, they have to want to work with the library board. This shouldn't be a conflict of, well, they want us to do something or we don't want to do something. You sh the best situation is if you work well together. Um, and aren't fighting against each other. So yeah, so they will accept suggestions from the library board or um, even the library director saying, hey, I, you know, somebody asked me if they could be on the board, so I'm passing on the name. You know, something just as, you know, casual as that, that they're at least willing to listen to those <laughs> um, suggestions. So try and work with your city as much as you can rather than at odds with them. 
Um, and a related question, related question that I sometimes hear is, well, can we have someone who's, you know, not within the city limits proper? And that is, again, a local decision. Um, it also kind of depends if you're getting funds, like if you're a city library that gets county funds. Well, the county mm -hmm. might actually insist on having a representative on the board that they get to uh, get to a point. And that is that is yeah. another part of the state statute that's not on this slide. Um, but, you know, sometimes there's not enough people within city limits. Um, so maybe you, you the uh, city council is okay with getting people who, who also work in the city or live within X number of miles from the city limits or, or something like that. State statute is unclear Yeah. on if there is a problem with that, um, but no one's been dinged for it. That, that I recall if they've expanded that group, no. so. No. Um, yeah, and that's funny. I don't, you said you can't see the questions, but somebody just asked that. <laughs> Do board members have to live in the city proper? Um, and that's actually a question we've gotten often enough that uh, yeah. years ago, um, Richard Miller, our, for, our former library director of library development, had written up, a, and I've got a link to it that I'll include, um, uh, about residency requirements for Nebraska public library boards, because we do get that question asked a lot. And he did a little analysis of what is in the state statutes and what's in other statutes that may, ref, you know, affect this and basically came up yeah and came up with exactly what you said they do not directly say they have to um mm -hmm. it is um up to each community but uh if you are going to have allow non-residents a non i.e non-factual taxpayers become or living outside the city limits uh put it in writing in in your stat in your bylaws that it is allowed don't just say yeah. oh yeah we'll just let them because someone could come along and say well they don't even live here why are you allowing that if you do want to do that the um and this would be like it says here the city council or village board determines how every how they are have them put <laughs> it somewhere in the bylaws that yes it is okay that people from outside the, the city can be, you know, even though they're not in the city limits, they may be on a rural farm and their their family uses the library. <laughs> they just don't happen to live in the city limits. Yeah. That, that's, okay, you know. But or it could be money. that they, they, you know, they're constantly buying lunch at the local cafe. Well, they're, they're providing tax dollars. In, um, in some way, <laughs> yes, exactly, yeah. yeah. So, um, and I have seen, I, I've been in, in this position long enough now that city councils one year will say no absolutely not and then a couple of years later it's like yeah we're having real problems getting people to fill all of our boards we're going to expand mm -hmm. um so things can change over the years so if they said no before they might say yes now or vice versa so. oh, yeah yep you can always change it as the situation changes yeah okay um another question this is much more specific and I'm assuming possibly coming from a specific situation. Uh, can mm -hmm. the mayor's can the mayor's spouse be on the board? Oh, but yeah, family relations. That's always a fun one. Um, <laughs> it is not explicitly prohibited in state statute. Um, it is somewhat questionable in, mm -hmm. in some cases, but we also have to realize that in some communities the availability of, of people to be on a library board might be small enough that if you took out relations you wouldn't have enough people to fill most <laughs> of the boards yeah um so it, that's why it, it's not in there because we know that you know there are some communities where it, if you go back far enough there's sometimes common ancestors so where do you draw the line and mm -hmm um yeah so it, it's not prohibited but it certainly is something that if you can stay away from that would be a good thing just mm -hmm. because it, it it helps draw a much brighter line between city council and library board you don't want to have any questionable anyone questioning the you know ethics mm -hmm. of who, who is on the board and if they are, how they may be influenced and if that's a problem. 
It also yeah. will depend on the way your city is. Is does everyone know that it's okay? The mayor's spouse is not going to do any. They're not going to like say something or push for something that they shouldn't just because there's yeah. a mayor's spouse. Um, you know, it, yeah. it's going to vary city by city. So yeah, not legally yeah. Uh, prohibited. Not the best situation because of the ethics and the and the optics of it could be questionable. Yeah. But if um, it's what it, you got to work with, it's what you got to work with. Yeah. It, it, in some areas, depending on their social circles, it becomes really hard to um, fit within the Open Meeting Act as far as gatherings of officials. Oh, yeah. If they start talking about the board meeting and you know, or this or that. They could That's unintentionally be, be followed, yeah. right? I'm not saying it's impossible that they, they, they are able to have enough self-awareness that they will not talk about it mm -hmm. when they're Shut in a group the with other people. Once it crosses that line and say, nope, we got to wait until an actual meeting. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. An official meeting. Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll talk more about that at the Open Meetings Act session. Absolutely. All right. So... Okay, um, board organization is 51204. Um, so it is the library board who elects officers for the library board. So that election happens, they say after their appointment, it's, there's usually an annual term date in, in many situations. Is that, that's what they mean in this. You must have a president and secretary as your office, as on your officers you can give everyone an officer title if you really wanted to but state statute <laughs> does say president and secretary um, and you have a majority of your board must be there to do business so if you have a five-person board you need three people in attendance to vote on anything so Okay. I don't know if you were trying to say something, Krista, or not. No. So, okay. Nope. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I'll uh, to the next slide. <laughs> and the title here is is another copy and paste error, but the 205 is down there. The library board shall have the power to make and adopt such bylaws, rules, and regulations for its own guidance and for government of the library and reading room. So this means the library board is coming up with your policies right the computer use policy the collection development policy the, the book feedback policy displays policy um, hours that type of thing all falls under library board they have that power to create those rules and regulations so as long as they don't violate the rest of this chapter so you can't go and say we're going to have a seven person library board because that is decided by city ordinance or county ordinance or whatever mm -hmm. but you could say these are our hours or you could say this is our collection development policy and you know, so those are the types of things library board that is theirs not the city's mm -hmm. question we get a lot this one yep mm -hmm. who's in charge of making the rules you make your own yeah. rules the library board does. Okay. Another okay. question we get a lot. <laughs> control of funds. Okay. The library board shall have exclusive control of expenditures of all money collected or donated to the credit of the library fund of the renting structure of a library building supervision. Okay. Key phrase here. Shall have exclusive. We rarely see that anywhere else in, in, in library law. Uh, here in the state, but here it is. Library board shall have exclusive control. I also want to point out that state auditor's office um, has put this down in other reports looking at some cities and villages. Uh, one of the, the best examples of this would be Broadwater back in 2009. Um, and, and again, I don't use this as the same declarative statement is like a judicial review because it is kind of involving the context of that situation. But they reiterated, this is a state auditor's office 
recommend that the Village Library Board retain exclusive control over Village Library expenditures. Okay. So we do have the auditor's office saying, yeah, the library board gets to decide what they're spending the money on. Mm -hmm. I know there's and a lot the of that shall versus may. Those words are very important and very different. May yeah. is optional, shall is required. I don't know what's the definition, but there is it, no. It, it means, it's not really optional. No. Someone else can't come in and take it from them. Nope. So, um, um, and I do want to go on to the next slide and build on this. I believe it's 209. So all taxes, taxes yes. levied or collected and all funds donated or any way acquired um, shall be kept up separate and apart from all other funds of the city. So this doesn't mean you need your own separate checking account, but they do need to be um, at least accounting wise separate from the general fund mm -hmm. um, it shall be drawn upon and paid out by the treasurer of such city village county or township upon vouchers signed by the president of the library board and authenticated by a secretary of such board and shall not be used or dispersed for any other purpose in any other matter so i'm going to go back to that same state auditor statement um, that so I talked about a little bit, the Village Library Board retains exclusive control with subsequent review and approval of such expenditures necessary. Once approved by the Village Library Board, expenditures should be paid out by the Village's Treasurer. So it doesn't say in there that the city has to give a secondary vote. Um, they can certainly review, and that is well within their purview, and it's good government for them to actually review, but it's not necessarily um, required that they give approval for each and every transaction. Mm -mm. So, and this is, this, this becomes a conflict, right? Cause it's so out of the norm and none of the other departments work this way. Yeah. I think this is one thing that's, that's, that's a, that's a good thing to mention now is in Nebraska state statutes, this is uh, sometimes why city councils and village boards and even sometimes city attorneys, um, city administrators do not understand how to work with libraries because no other city department has these special laws that we have for live for public libraries. And they don't realize they just it's just a, they just don't know. And that's OK. Mm -hmm. We will inform them. We will we will we will we were, we're here to teach them <laughs> that it is different for libraries and there are state statutes and you do have to think work with them differently. And this is one key one that, yeah, um, the library, their funds have to be kept separate. Um, there can be one big bank account just for the city, but you do have to have that accounting showing. But this money in that account belongs to the library and the library only. You cannot use it for other things. Um, and this gets into the questions I've had about when um, donations or um, uh, like estates or on and, and pass on and, and given a bunch of money to the library and they said what it's for. So I've had questions about, well, the city wants to use it for something else. Nope. <laughs> they gave it to the library, it didn't give it to the city. And the same reason to keep the paperwork when you get any of these donations or um, anything given to you that says this is what the money is supposed to be used for. Um, I will mention the checks and balances of this. One, the library board is approved by the city, right? So they are putting, they are doing that rubber stamp of approval. These are people who we trust to to handle these responsibilities. Exactly. So that, that is that's is part of that trade off. Um, another part is they decide the big pool of money that the libraries get, right? The library can't just cut checks and then expect to get more money from the city. The city you have can, to work within and, the and, budget you've been given to start with, yes. Yes, exactly. Um, so it, it, if you, you know, spend all the money in the first month, well, I guess you're close to the library the second month of the fiscal year. Um, <laughs> So that there is that balancing point. It's not just like woohoo, libraries are are free to do whatever they want. There, there are these balances. Plus, 
there, there's some other things later on today that we'll talk about that the library boards have to do um, that also that you have to do these things. Um, so it's it's not all just fun and games. There, there's <laughs> responsibilities as well as the powers. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, this is one of the hardest things dealing with state statute and city councils that I've personally worked with is it's so different than other departments. Why can't it be the same? Our accounting systems don't work this way. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, too bad. Um, and then you mentioned city attorney. Sometimes they, some of them don't realize that there are things in chapter 51 for municipalities, right? They think it's just for like state library systems, mm. which we don't have. We have a state library, mm. but we don't have like a statewide other secondary system of libraries. Yeah. Um, so sometimes we have to remind them to look at chapter 51. Um, and also the state auditor, um, they haven't put out a statement like that recently in public, but other library boards have told me they've contacted the state auditor and their current interpretation is still the same as it was back then. Mm -hmm. um, you could always call the state auditor and say, we need to make sure we understand this process yeah. and get something in writing from them. And that can definitely help you if you're dealing with a city attorney or a city who is um, balking at this and saying, well, mm -hmm. no, no, here, the state auditor is telling us, do you really want a real audit done of this? Probably not. <laughs> um, okay. We have a couple of questions that come in related um, to this, and I'm going to jump to the second one here. If you don't okay. expend your entire budgeted amount, should that mm -hmm. money remain in a library fund or does it go back to the general fund at the end of the budget year? I would say, no, it doesn't go into the general, it's your money. All funds donated and any way acquired shall be kept for the use of the library. Yeah, it, that is one of those situations where it's not clear, hmm. to be honest, because um, it doesn't say one way or another about what to do with the library fund year after fiscal year. Um, there is a statement, uh, I don't think I have a slide on it, but it, it is in this this area of state law where the municipality can create a sinking fund. Oh, so any yeah. left any leftover funds, donations or whatever can go into to a library specific sinking fund, which would then be used for big capital projects like renovations, remodels, new HVAC, you but know, still just for the library. Just for library use, right. Um, but you can't have a library specific one. I think that's probably the cleanest way to handle leftover funds. Um, I can't, there was one community that, that recently put that in, then they switched like the city admin and the village board and everyone. So I don't know if that's still in play there, but it certainly is the cleanest way to handle any leftover library funds. Um, it, it makes it undisputable, right? Yeah. So, and that's just my opinion, not my, not a legal opinion. Mm -hmm. So. Um, another question is what about library foundations? Okay. Does this library apply to library foundations and are foundations required to turn their financials over to the city government? Another great question that has popped up in the past few years. Um, okay, so the base is library foundations are separate entities. They are 501c3s. Those are, it's private money. It's mm -hmm. not city money. However, recently, I want to say fat past five years, there's a new accounting standard that's being put into play that they put in support organizations as part of the city audit. That I do not, I'm not sure if there's a legal requirement to do so. The most I've seen is, is an accounting standard that more municipalities are doing for I don't know why. Mm. But that I, I, they have a name for it too, and I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, mm. I generally would say that no, the foundation does not need to be part of a city audit, but 
the, the next question is, is this a battle worth having right now for you? Um, so that, that, that is something I would need to, to see a little bit more on if this is being required by some other agency and it just hasn't made it in state statute. Like is the state auditor wanting this type of approach done across municipalities mm -hmm. as a matter of practice and not as state statute? Yeah, because um, yeah, I know there's it, no statutes that state that, no. So yeah, it, it as far as my understanding, and this is where one of those cases, if you really want to get into it, you may want to talk with a legal attorney, you know, legal professional. Mm -hmm. um, it is private money. It's being donated, you know, for that group, not to the city proper. Mm -hmm. um, and my understanding is it's just a city, a, a county practice that many cities are starting to adopt. I can see in some situations that a private foundation may balk at saying, who are you to ask me, us about our, we're a private foundation. We do not exactly. answer to you. <laughs> yeah. We don't have to I, I, and you know, if you're going to do this, we may just change what we do as a foundation and do something else with our money now because we're private yeah. and we can. <laughs> yeah, that th that becomes a question of will that fight create more more hostility than it's worth at the time and mm -hmm. long term, right? In some cases, it's absolutely worth that fight. In some yeah. cases, it's like nope. This is private money. These are all donors. It's not state statute. It's not your money. And then there's maybe other organizations where it's like, well, we're looking to build and we're going to need the city's help to make that happen. You know, so we got to play nice with them at the moment about this particular issue. Right. That it's more more of your local political capital than state statute in that that time frame i my understanding is unless there's something i'm missing which is possible they don't have a legal thing to stand on um if someone does is given a legal like here state statute xyz says it please feel for please forward it to me so that way i can look at it and and, and learn from that myself but i'm not currently aware of any legal standard or, that says it must happen or you said if someone has asked um the state auditor's opinion that's a place to see what they say that's something you can mm -hmm. to as well the state auditor has told us this and if anyone looks at our books this is what they're going to look for so yeah we might ask um, them for clarification ahead of time just to see yeah i will mention that if the foundation wants to do that is the foundation that makes the request it is not the librarian on behalf of the foundation because if you are truly saying we are separate that it must be the separate entity that's making the inquiries. Mm -hmm. Yes, right. I know. Need to ask the the auditor's office the question, not the library. Yes. Yep. 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 I, I know there are a lot of friends and foundation groups that really work closely with the librarian to do all sorts of things, and that's fine. That's working together. Uh, in most cases, it's fine. But in this case, if you are truly saying we are a separate entity money wise then that separate entity needs to be the one asking right because yes. the librarian does not work for the library foundation or friends group yep. so absolutely okay good uh, questions yes yes definitely um we're going to go on to board powers and before we do jump in this i'm just going to mention we are a little after 11 o'clock that's okay we did start late this morning and we are going to go as long as it takes to get through all the slides we have here today and answer any questions you have so please do stick with us um, and get your questions in um, if you do have to leave because you're only a lot of the hour for the show that's fine we're recording the whole thing you can always come back and watch the rest of the recording later yeah if you have questions go ahead ask krista ask your regional system director mm -hmm. um we're we've got some more but i think they'll have more discussion so just that way you kind of know where we're at but we're pretty close to the end of chapter 51 uh, as far as what I was planned. So we're, we'll get there. So thanks for your patience. Yep. Uh, speaking of library board powers, 51 to 11. Okay, this is the, the part that got changed most recently. And that was back in 2009, I think, if memory serves. 
a good portion of it stayed the same. They just added a, couple, a sentence at the end. So they looked at it. They kept some parts. So that must mean it's still valid, right? And this is the part that I'm going to talk about. Library board may erect, lease, occupy, appropriate building for use of library. Appoint a suitable librarian and assistants, fix the compensation of such appointees, and remove such appointees at the pleasure of the board. The library board sets the, the pay for the librarian and the assistants. The library board hires the librarian and assistants. We, a lot of places don't follow this. They follow the city sliding scale or whatever. Now, if the library board decides, yes, this is appropriate, we're just gonna follow the city sliding scale for whatever rate, that's their choice. But really in state statute, the library board is the one setting the pay rate, which is very important these days because I'm, you know, even though there's a minimum wage, there is a carve out for some government employees. And so that's hitting librarians and library assistants pretty hard. Um, the next part is what changed. The governing body of this county, city, or village shall approve any personnel, administrative, or compensation policy or procedure before implementation. So you do have to go through the city and they have to approve it. I do want to mention there is a nuance in here is they shall approve. They shall not, it does not say shall mandate, mm -hmm. right? The library board goes up to the city and says, will you approve this policy? It's not the city council comes down to the library and says, you must follow this. A little bit of a nuance there. One that mm -hmm. got missed a lot uh, early on, so. And this is personnel or compensation policies only. Right. Not collection development policy, running of the library policies. This is specific to just these specific situations. Yeah. And, and this is the section that causes some, a lot of the first class cities to go to advisory instead of governing. Mm -hmm. And in many cases, I'm finding it's really just the personnel and money that we talked about earlier, and they don't care about the rest. Yeah. So, um, but again, if you're in that second class village status, this is still law of the land. Um, mm -hmm. so. And I do have a little ba oh, other background on this too. Um, mm -hmm. um, from from Richard Miller again, back when this was first done, I was able to um, find some of his explanation about this. Um, that this um, change, that second, that last section, section there, was proposed by the League of Nebraska Municipalities um, because of some concerns that libraries were not following proper personnel rules and regulations, um, and to protect mm -hmm. the librarians and library boards from liabilities that might arise from having a personnel policy that has not been endorsed by their community governing body, and therefore it might not be covered under the community's liability policy. So this is this is really only for the purpose of making sure the library is following the appropriate city personnel rules and regulations. Um, there was some concern that they weren't. The library board was just not not really paying attention to that. So the league said, mm -hmm. "Well, we need to make the, make sure they pay attention." <laughs> so this the city no the library board as Scott said sets the salaries, you know, hires librarians, all of that. But they you should be looking at what is it, what the city's. Um, rules are about setting those salaries and things and you should work together again you know work with your you know board and saying you know okay what is our budget and what does the city want us to do as far as salaries or what can or we can't can can or can't we do and make sure you're working within those um, and the city always has the you know a, you know ability to not approve the you know a salary or appointee that you might make um, if they need to, but only because it is conflicting with some sort of rule or regulation that the city has in place. So yeah, yeah. So for the, the library, if they had not been following the rules and regulations already set out by the city. Yeah, yeah. So like your individual choice, just they can't, they can't say, no, you can't hire that person, but they can look at your process and say, you didn't follow this non-discriminatory or, or this yeah. type of process, right? They right. can't, there, there's a distinction there. That, and the policy or procedure, those particular phrases are important, yeah. yeah. 
Um, and yeah, and there was a case where a library board ran a, a search and did not do a good job as far as following non-discriminatory statements or, you know, who actually had access to the actual applications. And that's a case where the library board could have really messed up um, if, if they didn't realize, wow, we really legally did not do a really good search. There are so many areas where things could go badly. So they had to restart the whole process. Um, so it, it, it can be a really good thing if the folks mm -hmm. at the city office, you know, it's like they do a lot of hiring compared to the library usually, usually, and uh, they know what, you know, if you do this, there could be a discriminatory hiring lawsuit, or if you do this, well, you just tainted the, the whole pool and given someone an unfair advantage at the interview stage or what whatnot. So things to keep in mind. Oops. Um, all right, so we do have a question about that sentence, sentence here. Um, what if the second sentence, and I think we might have answered this, I don't know, is interpreted by the city as that we shall follow all personnel and compensation procedures as set by the city, basically anything that has to do with finances or personnel? Mm -hmm. uh, again, that's, that's where the nuance comes. It's like they shall approve the library board's policy it doesn't say that they will mandate the policy. Right. So it's coming from the library board side saying, here's what we want to do. And then the city can say oh, regarding that proposed or submitted policy from the library board, yes or no, um, mm -hmm. not here's what the city does and you have to follow it because it's the other direction. Yeah. Right. <laughs> now, but realistically, we know there are going to be some boards that until your policy proposal matches exactly what they want, want they, they won't approve, approve it. Approve. Yeah. So in we the know end, that it's happens. not being what they want it to be. Uh, but again, state statute does say it's the library board's responsibility mm -hmm. um, to have to create those rules and regulations for the governance and usage of the library. So. All right, and we have another question that came up um, about budget. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to look okay. this up here. Okay. Um, there we go. Okay. Okay. Um, we have certain line items in the library budget for maintenance, HVAC, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Is it permissible for the friends of the library to draw from the library budget to cover additional expenses for grant matching or not enough funds to cover improvement projects? Oh, my. Um. Um, so no. the friends want to pull out of the city coffers so that way they have matching funds for a grant. Mm-hmm. Is how I'm understanding the project that I guess they were uh, wanting to willing to fund was another part of it too. Um, so that is something that if this if everyone involved is on board with being partners in said grant, it makes sense. But it is not something that the that can be done unilaterally. Generally, putting money from the city budget, the city library budget, into a friends or foundation is not usually a good idea. But if it's an actual partnership, like the city and friends are both jointly involved in this whole project, and everyone's on board, there might that's a little bit cleaner way of handling it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure about the situations that of this particular case, if that's what's going on, or if it's just we're wondering what we what we can plan for, mm -hmm. right? There's going to be some context in that particular type of question that that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would not plan on taking stuff from the city side to the friends or foundation. That that generally does not 
hap that's not a good thing to happen taking no. tax money and putting it into the nonprofit. no yeah right but if you were both like if there was a grant that was applied for and both the library slash city and the friends group were listed as the grant applicants mm -hmm. then you are working together and there's some document that states that and then you would have discussions about okay what money from which applicant is going to be used for what mm -hmm. yeah that's kind of how i'm here reading yeah, that situation that would be a way to do that but not just and eh, we need more money let's just pull some from there no yeah yeah um and there are some cases especially with some big ticket items where like friends and foundation money goes into the city especially for like big remodels because then the city doesn't have to pay sales tax friends and foundations oh. do that's a that's and, something to think about yeah and, and so there are times where it's advantageous for everyone that the the foundation donates some money to the library proper and so the city cuts the checks and, and that's usually reserved for those big things like hey really big yeah new building building remodel that type of thing it's not generally done hey we need to buy books not generally done that for for smaller ticket items um but yeah it you could like i said you couldn't take the money from the city and give it to the friends usually unless that is part of the grant where it comes from the 501c3 and it's a little bit more involved <laughs> but generally don't jump for the idea of giving city tax based money to nonprofit. It's kind of a, a good rule of thumb, unless there's an actual partnership in writing for that. Now, oh, Krista, you, you agree with that? Yes. Yep. Definitely. Okay. Um, Okay. Well, we have a question here that goes back to the uh, statute about appointing uh, 51 to 11 about the part about appointing librarian assistants. Mm -hmm. And I think, okay, just use a little clarification. Okay. So the question is uh, 51 to 11 says that the board appoint, can appoint a suitable librarian and assistants. But in the best practices listed in our Nebraska Library Board Manual, we have a document on um, our website, the board manual says that the library director hires staff mm -hmm. well it, what it says in the board manual is the um library director recommends the employment of who should be hired but then the board has to approve it so the board actually does does the final appointing of the, the staff but a library director can say hey we've interviewed and found this person and they recommend this is who should we would like to hire but you so the so the director can like find the person interview just you know say they want to hire him but it has to be presented to the library board to approve it that's where it is the appointing um actually happens so that's the differentiation there okay thank you Lisa. okay all right Moving along to the rest of the library board powers. Okay, um, this one I'm not going to spend too much time on. It, it, it's there. The library board shall establish rules and regulations for the government of the library. Um, so this the library board sets overdue fines if you have them, or replacement fines, or you know whatever policy goes on there. This just kind of reiterates that. Um, yeah, and so there's really not much to add here. This is more of a reiteration of what we've already said. And this um, is a good part to refer to if your city council or board, city village board says, we want to tell you how to run the library and what to charge and what you can do. No. Here's um, the part of the state statutes that says it's the library board. So I, I will mention at this point, I have seen some 
communities where the library policies are actually now city ordinances. It, it must have happened a long time ago. So mm -hmm. that's not a place for your library policy is in city ordinance, um, unless it's really necessary to do so because of, I don't know, so, some crazy repeat offenders or something. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, I, I've seen library policy and city ordinance, and that's that's the city council voting to put it into ordinance, so therefore not exactly in their powers. Library policy should be in library board hands, so. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, the airport. <laughs> ah, the airport, yeah. And so 51 to 13, the annual report, this is also part of the responsibilities of the board. Um, and part of it has to do with that fiscal stuff. If you're doing this, that means you're showing, you know, your fiscal responsibility in doing the, some things we said earlier about, you know, doing exclusive control of your finances. This is you coming back to the people who gave you your money and said, this is what we spent the money on. Um, so on or before the second Monday in February. So it doesn't have to be on this date. And I know plenty of communities, they have all of the department folks come in and give a end of fiscal year report, say in November, if they have a, a September, October fiscal year. If you cover this stuff, you've complied. You're yeah. following your fiscal year. It's before the second Monday in February. It's to the city council and you're good. You don't need to do a second one. Um, and these are mandatory bits in there that you have. I know a couple of communities, it, they had a time crunch. They took the report to the commission, the statistical survey, the bibliostat stuff, printed it out and sent it to the city council. Done. Yeah. Uh, it's not pretty. <laughs> it doesn't give you a chance to highlight things. But it fulfills a requirement and especially for you know your first year maybe you don't it's like i just got this done i don't want to write another report send it in you're good <laughs> yeah um i didn't have it on this slide but there is also a requirement that there is a affidavit which is just a statement signed by the library board that says everything in this report to the best of our knowledge is accurate and true you don't need it notarized you, you know it doesn't need to be fancy but there does need to be a statement from the board member signed by the board member saying to the best of our knowledge this is accurate so that is the step that sometimes gets overlooked you want to follow that so that the library board is fulfilling their promise um but yeah i mean and then i also want to note state statute does not say you have to give a verbal report some people love doing it because it gives them a chance to be there in front of the, the city council and highlight things and, and show the emotional impact of something great there are other times where it's like i just need to get this in because we're, we're we already talk a lot they know we just need to do the formality yeah it doesn't even say that they have to read it <laughs> I guess, I'm just yeah, saying you, it will be delivered. Yes, <laughs> it, it will be delivered. That's it. So that is your obligation. But it does open a door for maybe some dialogue to highlight certain things, set the stage for next year's fiscal requests. Um, but it doesn't have to be if now's not the time. So yeah. something to keep in mind. It's a, a possible door to other interactions if you need it. So all right okay um we have some links here there are some other things in chapter 51 related to libraries but there are kind of rare instances so we're not covering them today but we gave you these these links nebraska state statutes it's all on the web mm -hmm. the by chapter you saw that we talked about chapter 51 chapter 15 chapter whatever so you can browse them that way or you can search so there's search interface too. These are the legal, you know, these are the state statutes. It's from the Nebraska legislature website. It's not some third party, yes. right? So that's, this is as legit 
If you want to double check what we've said, feel free. We're, we're giving you the links to do so. Uh, the Nebraska Library Board Manual, a link to the law section in the Board Manual, and also the Library Director Manual, because there are some other things that may be of interest for librarians, library boards, that we just did not cover. Things around like um, more on sinking funds, more on some other things. Um, so you can kind of get a synopsis of what else is out there that maybe Chris and I did not cover today. Mm -hmm. um, but again, don't take our word for it. The state <laughs> statutes are there. Yes. Look them up, double check. I mean, that I, I'm finding it's very important for us to say, it's like, I could have a handout with all of these state laws printed out, but they don't believe it because they don't, you know, someone just handed it to them. Great. Using some critical, you know, literacy skills here. It's like, I, I don't know you, I don't trust you. So here's where you can go, the definitive source to look it up. If you'd ask your state representative, where do I go to look up state statute? The website, they'll give you this URL. I, I think it's pretty important to show our work these days. So here it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's always good. Whenever I do reply in emails to anyone, I do give links to the statutes too, so that um, if you need to pass that on, yeah, you can tell them. If we have had that comment, we've seen heard that comment in in either city or um, village board meetings or library board meetings that, well, who is this system or director or <laughs> library commission telling us what we can and cannot do? Um, <laughs> here's the state law. I can't really get more specific. I mean, <laughs> it's a state law. End of sentence. I'm not <laughs> telling you what to do. I'm linking telling you where the law is that says says how you're supposed to do things um, so always a good idea to have those direct links to just say there it is right there mm -hmm. yeah. okay. and then the last slide just says questions um, all right so does anybody have any other questions um, questions, comments, situations you want to ask us about, we will um, answer any questions you have um, while we're here right now. Of course, you can always reach out to Scott or myself or any of the other system directors with questions you have later if they come up. So go ahead and type into your questions section. I'll pop back to this slide here so you can see that we do have those links. And everyone will have these slides while I'm waiting to see if anything comes in. Um, the slides will be available with the recording. <clears throat> I will make those fixes to some of those uh, little copy and paste um, typo errors that we had earlier before I put up the slides. So um, you'll have totally, um, everything will be correct that you'll have to reference later. Thank you, Krista. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I didn't have a chance and we just, you know, this is the most, you know, we just wrapped these things, this thing up this morning and didn't really <laughs> have a, a lot of time to double, double, triple check everything, but that's okay. Um, the statutes are out there and they're all correct. <laughs> yeah. Again, another reason to check those instead of yes. the <laughs> Um, but while I'm waiting to see if anybody types in anything else, um, thank you so much, Scott, for coming on today and talking about this. Um, we, as I said, we both, I know I get lots of questions about state statutes and what are we or aren't we allowed to do or what is the city allowed or not allowed to do. Uh, and I'm, I think it's great finally that we have done, finally, something here on Encompass Live about it that people can refer to. Um, if things do change, as was mentioned, that sometimes the, you know, certain uh, bills are presented that affect library operations and will change any of these laws. We'll do an update. Yeah, we'll we'll do a, a refresher. We know we have new library directors that come and go, and it's always good to have a reminder. So um, maybe after next year's uh, legislature is wrapped up, we'll see if anything has changed. If we need to do a revisit any of this. Yeah, like I yeah. said, the uh, Open Meetings Act session that we've got coming up on July 19th, we did do that about a year ago, and there have been a few tweaks to that coming, so. Well, uh, there were potential tweaks. None of them actually right. passed vote, but we had gone like three years straight with tweaks. Yes, so there have been lots of changes. Good, it's good to kind of plan on doing an annual evaluation uh, mm -hmm. on that. Um, and then there are some resources available 
through NLA if you want to watch like next year's session um, and, and get it, you know, kind of get more updates on on where things are as it's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so um, you may want to check out the NLA Advocacy Committee. Um, yes. And, and as far as even just monitoring, even if you're not going to or, or in a position to advocate, at least watching what's going on, um, they're improving each year on, on getting that education out on what is happening, what, what are the bills that could affect libraries. Even that might be beneficial for you. Mm -hmm. And they do oh. for um, public school. Every you know, there's some things that we're yes. only protecting school libraries this time around too. Yeah. Yeah, and and SLA for for schools is another good reason yes. for that. But but uh, but yeah, so it is something that that uh, more people are getting interested in as far as watching what what could be coming down the pipe. So yeah. Any uh, questions pop up or? No, I don't. Nobody's typed in anything yet. Well, we've been chatting away here at the end, so I think we are good to wrap things up for today. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I just want to say thanks, everyone, and, and sorry about the technical issues. Of yeah, course, we, we, we do this all the time through online stuff, and then today, uh -huh. the software goes, <laughs> to, goes crazy. Say, so. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, but thank you for your patience and, and uh, you know, no problem. better That's informed. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Better informed we are, the better we can provide for our communities in mm -hmm. a, a, a sustainable way. That's yes. Kind of the whole thing. So, Important to be aware of all this. Yeah. All right. I am going to change my display here. There we go. It worked. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that will wrap it up for today's show. Um, this is our um, the page for today's show. Um, as I said, I we the slides will be available afterwards. I'm going to pop back over to our main Encompass Live page here. Here we go. Um, if you use the search and your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, we are the only thing called that on the internet still. <laughs> so you'll come up with either our main page or our archive page and your results. So um, these are our upcoming shows. And then right under here is where the link is to our archives. Today's show will be at the top of the list here. Uh, should be up and ready by the end of the day tomorrow at the very latest, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me. Um, and I've got to update these, um, make some tweaks to the slides. Um, there'll be a link to the recording and a link to the slides here. Everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's ready. Uh, we also push it out into our social media too, to our mailing lists. Um, we have a Facebook page that is linked from various pages, the Encompass Live page, um, and we use Twitter and Instagram. So if you like to use Facebook, give us a like over here. Here's a reminder to log into today's show, meet the presenters thing. Um, where's one from last week? There we go. Announcement when the recordings are available. So we'll post everything out on there. Also on our Twitter and Instagram, we use the NCUMP Live little abbreviation hashtag for anything about the show. So you can keep an eye on things there as well. Um, if you are interested in that residency requirement, um, this is this long page here. If you just type in residency and the search on our page, I believe I've got it linked from in the board manual somewhere too. Um, that really digs into how Richard did some uh, evaluation of that. Uh, while I'm here on the, on the archives, I'll show you there is a search feature. You can search our show archives if you want to see if we've done a show on any particular topic in the past. Uh, you can search the full show archives or just the most recent 12 months if you just want something really current. That is because this is our full show archives. And I'm not going to scroll all the way down because it is it is huge. This goes back to when Encompass Live first premiered, which was in January 2009. So we have going on 15 years, oh my gosh, <laughs> of show archives here. So just pay attention to the original broadcast date of anything. Um, our shows, um, some of the shows will be great and stand the test of time, have good, useful resources still, but some things will become old, outdated, resources and services may have changed drastically or no longer exist. 
Uh, people may work at totally different libraries than when they actually presented to for us. Uh, so just be aware of what you are watching if you do watch any of our show archives. So um, here's our schedule for the next month. I um, hope you join us to, uh, next week when it is Pretty Sweet Tech Day. The last Wednesday of every month is Pretty Sweet Tech Day and Encompass Live, and that is when normally um, Amanda Sweet, our technology innovation librarian, comes on the show and talks about something techie related. And for the next two shows, we actually have a guest presenter, uh, Andrew Sherman, goes by Sherm, um, who's our new, new on our, um, computer services team here at the Library Commission, he is going to be talking next week about securing your computers for library for public use. Uh, so he's going to do a presentation about that next week. So if you are concerned about that, keeping secure for um, protection on, of, of your um, computers and your library patrons, uh, join us for that. Uh, some of you may know Sherm, he was a library director on our Sydney Public Library and now he is here at the Library Commission. He'll also be with us at the end of July to talk about internet filtering for E-rate uh, SIPA compliance and cybersecurity. So doing filtering for not just for E-rate purposes, but for just your own safety and security. So um, you can join us for that next. Um, Pretty sweet tech at the end of July as well. And then we've got our other shows here coming up and um, keep an eye on the schedule for as of getting things booked um, out into August. So uh, thank you everyone for being here with us today. Thank you for sticking around. Um, and thank you, Scott. Uh, happy to be here. here. Yeah, and um, we'll be back with Scott on July 19th, as we mentioned, sign up for the Open Meetings Act session. We're gonna dig much more into that. On, on July 19th, it gets its own show because it needs it. <laughs> so do register for that one as well and we'll see you back again then. So thank you everybody and hopefully we'll see you all at some future episode of Encompass Live. All right, bye-bye. <laughs>